Ahoy! Welcome to another exciting episode of The Writer Talks. The Christmas cheer is all around us and feasting is already in full swing. Another addition to this festive fun is that it is Jane Austen's birthday and The Writer Talks will begin by paying homage to her everlasting legacy. I will start today's episode by reading a few lines from Austen's renowned classic, Pride and Prejudice, that continues to hold sway amongst both academics as well as pleasure readers. Here goes. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his first entering a neighborhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered as the rightful property of some one or other of your daughters. My dear Mr. Bennett, said his lady to him one day, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? Mr. Bennett replied that he had not. But it is, returned she, for Mrs. Long has just been here and she told me all about it. Mr. Bennett made no answer. Bennett made no answer. Do not you want to know who has taken it? cried his wife impatiently. You want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. This was invitation enough. I hope you enjoyed reliving those eternal lines by Austin, who ushered in a new style and set a new precedent for female writers. A very happy birthday, Jane Austen. Thank you for writing those wonderful novels. Legacy is such an interesting word, don't you think? Particularly the legacy of a person. I'm not referring to mere monetary inheritance here. It is much more everlasting, a precious legacy in life, bequeathing your life experiences and cherished aspirations. My guest today, Emily Johnson from North Carolina, is one such fortunate recipient of her mom's legacy in life. Her novel, Bird of Paradise is a story of remembrance and romance that has been written by her as well as her mom, Marilyn Ann Hughes. This redolent, replete with rich imagery tale, chronicling the life of Ariana Haywood, is an evocative coming-of-age novel that seamlessly embodies the pennings from mother and daughter. Emily, with a degree in journalism and mass communication, has had a long experience working in the advertising agency and has spent several years working in the fundraising department and writing grants for a professional ballet company. She is an avid golfer, reader, and enjoys skiing. So let's dive in and listen to the fascinating aspects of Emily's writing and life experiences. But before that, my dear subscribers, please do get in more people on board so that we can continue to engage with brilliant writers from across the world. Please like, share and subscribe to the Writer Talks. I do hope you enjoy watching me talk to this ebullient writer, Emily Johnson from North Carolina. I know it is the holiday season and it is all about celebrations, family gatherings and feasting, but it is also the best time to catch up on all the reading. Don't forget to pick up a copy of Emily's novel, Bird of Paradise, that is available on Amazon. And if you haven't picked up a copy of my debut novel, it must have been love, but please do so now. It is also available on Amazon, both as an ebook as well as a paperback, and is steadily garnering five star reviews from readers. Until next time, smile, stay safe, and Merry Christmas! Ahoy! Ahoy! Welcome to the Writer Talks. With a degree in journalism and mass communication, and hobbies ranging from skiing to golfing to ballet, here's Emily Johnson joining me all the way from the United States. Hi, Emily. Hi. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being on the Writer Talks. And how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's been busy going into the holidays, uh, but always an exciting time of year. <laughs> Absolutely. I see the festive spirit already making its presence of uh, the Christmas tree in the background. Oh, yes. Yeah, you can never do it too early. So the pumpkins go out from Halloween, the Christmas decorations come in. That's that's lovely. And, and it's a great way to uh, beat this pandemic and the whole gloom that it has. Yeah. Right, absolutely. We definitely need some cheer. <laughs> totally. You're, you're a unique guest for more reasons than one. The first one obviously being uh, your novel, Bird of Paradise. Would it be apt to refer to you as a co-author of this book alongside your mom and yours? Yes. Oh, yes. 
certainly. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was her baby to begin with. Um, so you know, I, I I certainly refer to it as her book. I kind of forget about the fact that I I wrote part of it as well. <laughs> It, it, it's such a great, wonderful legacy to inherit the aspirations of your mom and uh, penning her life experiences. What was the uppermost thought uh, as you got down to writing this book? Probably, um, I mean, I, I picked up this book less than six months after she passed away. So I was still um, in a state of shock and healing. Um, she had battled cancer for years and years and years, but the very end of it came very quickly. Um, and so I kind of, it was, it was using her words to help heal from losing her. And the thing that I wanted to focus on most really was making sure that I was true to her writing. Um, this was her book and it was always going to be her book and her writing style was very different from mine. Um, being in journalism and marketing, you know, brevity is where you want to go, get to your point right away and head on. Um. Her style was very descriptive, so I really had to um, take the time to study what I was you know, describing, make sure that it was true um, for the time period that this is set in, and really just, you know, it was layer upon layer of trying to get to the level of description that she used um, so that nobody would know where, where one started and, and the other left off. And I, and I must say that it, 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 it's... Uh beautifully uh, it's such a cohesive book it's so beautifully woven it it comes across in one voice it doesn't come in two distinct voices at all oh, well thank you so much i mean that was really my ultimate goal on this um even my publisher doesn't know <laughs> where the line was um you know because there's that very black and white line obviously um but then you know when it, she left no indication of where she wanted to take the story um she had written all but one character and all I had was a name and an idea of who that character was supposed to be um, and how they were supposed to interact with the main character. So when I decided to, to take, the, take it into one direction and I came up with the overall kind of theme of where it was going to go, I had to go back into what she had written and add and, and adjust and, um, you know, and, and take things in a way to where the conversations would make sense down the road. Um, so that was, you know, I can't say the percentage that she and I wrote because it just kind of all mixed in. Fair enough. Fair enough. We will continue to talk about Bird of Paradise and your writing process besides the host of other things. But first, let's dive into the rapid response section. Okay. <laughs> are, are you ready? <laughs> I am as ready as I possibly can be. Okay, great. Here's the first one. Between writing a novel and your uh, multi-million dollar grants that you do write, which do you think is more nerve-wracking? Certainly the grants, because um, a lot of people are counting on you to write those correctly and get the money, because um, they're all for nonprofits that really need it. So there's just so, there's, there's so many you know, rules and regulations and steps you have to follow, and then you have to figure out, well, who's going to be reading this, and who's most likely, you know, what voice are they going to want? When you're writing a novel, it just comes creatively out of your head. Um, okay. So yeah, grants, for sure. I agree with you completely. Now, if, if it was entirely up to you, what is that one stereotype about a coming-of-age novel that you would debunk? That coming-of-age novels are only meant for teenagers and young adults. <laughs> Um, you know, we've all come of age in one way or the other, and we've all probably experienced very similar situations, regardless of where we grew up. So, you know, it, it, coming of age is for everybody. It's for, you know, the adult and, and beyond who can reminisce and, you know, see the other side of coming of age. Because when we're coming of age, everything is the biggest issue in the whole wide world, and nothing's ever going to be okay again after it happens. But then you get to be an adult, and you can look back on it, and say, well, that meant nothing in the scheme of things. Um, but then while you're going through it, you can identify directly with the characters. Um, so really, I always thought coming of age was for younger um, audiences until I started writing one. And then I realized that it really could appeal to everybody. Right. Now, again, if you had the option to choose between your book being a Pulitzer Prize winner or a bestseller, what would your choice be? For this particular book, I have to say a bestseller. Um, I would love to win a Pulitzer Prize. 
So <laughs> that'd be amazing. But I think this book would better fit a bestseller. Fair enough. Now, if you had the chance to meet either Shady Salinger or Isabel Allende, whom would you meet? And what is the one thing that you would ask? Oh, my goodness. Um, I guess J.D. Salinger. And uh, I'd probably be so overwhelmed I wouldn't know what to ask. <laughs> so <laughs> probably just one of those very generic questions. Sit down and tell me everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sorry to evade the specifics on that one, but it would be very difficult. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now, if you were given the choice to pursue volcanology or ancient archaeology, which one would you opt for? I'd have to say ancient archaeology because um, I just love learning history from the people that left things behind. I am um, a, a huge, um, oh, I'm a nerd about Pompeii. I mean, from the time I was a little kid, I wanted everything that they wrote and videoed about Pompeii. Um, and then got a chance to see it in person when I was 17. And so I think really it, it's the history because regardless of where it is in the, in the world, it's us as human beings. Um, but then, you know, when it comes to Pompeii, there's a volcano there too. So you kind of get both of them. <laughs> yes, best, best of the two. Best of both worlds in that sense. <laughs> Now, on a lighter way, do you celebrate um, getting the birdies on a golf course or dash off to the snowy peaks to ski when you have the time? I say it's probably birdies on the golf course. Um, I've played golf ever since I was eight, and I'm not going to tell you how many years that's been. Um, we'll just keep that hidden. <laughs> um, that's certainly the way that I prefer to celebrate and spend my time. Um, I love skiing. I love the mountains, but from North Carolina, they're very hard to get to. Um, so golf is certainly the easier option. Right. Now, between San Francisco and New York, your ideal city would be? I'm sorry, you froze. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, between San Francisco and New York, your ideal city would be? Um, I have to say uh, New York in this, for this. Um, simply because I love Broadway and you can't get, you know, except for London's West End, you cannot get that level of, of theater anywhere else. Um, my dad would probably kill me for hearing me say New York over San Francisco. Um, I love San Francisco dearly, but there's just, New York has just got that vibe with the arts. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being a sport. Moving on to, uh, to your novels, so Bird of Paradise. Is it also your favorite club? It is. Um, I have to say I've always loved it, and I, I think that's really because my mom loved it. Um, she had a bird of paradise that always sat right by her the pond they had in their backyard. Um, so I've always been, I've always loved it. Now, it was, was that the reason behind the choice of the title? Um... You know what? That's one of those things that I don't know. She was the one that, that titled it. Um, and actually, the theme of the Bird of Paradise through it was something that came from me. <laughs> so, um, but she, she originally titled it Letters to My Daughter um, and, and then changed it at some point to Bird of Paradise, um, mostly because I think when she started writing this, she knew that you know, she was facing her own mortality. She had advanced stage cancer, um, and the doctors had told her she probably wasn't going to have much more time. Um, and she decided she was not going anywhere. Um, and so I think this was a way of continuing her voice, um, knowing that she may not be there for me. Right. Now, what was the most difficult part to uh, write in this novel? Um, it, Really, the, the hardest part from the technical aspect was ensuring that the part that I wrote 100% from that, that line of where she stopped wasn't obvious that it was a different author. Um, her writing style is very descriptive. Mine isn't as much because I'm in marketing and advertising and, and you don't write a thousand words to say one thing. Um, and so I really had to work hard to adjust my writing style to match hers. Um, and it also was set in a different time period than I've ever lived in. It was set in the 60s and 70s. Um, 
So I had to go back and research what things were in the 60s and 70s because they're not necessarily the same today. Well, I can tell you they're definitely not the same today. Um, so, you know, and then it was emotionally difficult. I, I picked this up right after losing my mom um, at a, a place where I think she intended um, kind of me to go. And, and so there was a lot written from my heart and it was a very emotional experience for me. Naturally, I, I, I completely understand that. I, I, I love the highly engrossing backstory, actually, but when we started talking about um, talking to each other about this work, and that's, that's, that's exactly what got me uh, very, very interested. Now, the manner in which the book reads also, uh, I think I mentioned this a while back, Although it's a collaborative piece, um, the, no the novel doesn't seem so. It, 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 it reads in one voice. Uh, and uh, particularly the poetic prose and the redolent imagery of the island. How, do, how did you manage this? Um, well, I read through what she had written over and over and over and over again. Uh, because this all came from her mind, you know, and, and she never let anybody read it. Um, nobody had read it until after she passed away and she'd left what she had written for me. Um, so it was really, I had to sit there with a pen and paper and make a list of the people and who they were and how she described things to ensure that I continued that on. Um, but she just, it just came from her mind. And I, she and I always had this connection. Um, I'm an only child. Um, and she and I just, I just felt like her voice spoke through me. Right. Fair enough. And, and I can completely relate to that. Um, were, were you apprehensive about this novel being uh, 570 pages at, at any point in time? Well, I mean, it, 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 yes, it's a long one. Um, it was when I had finished it, the first draft um, through without kind of just getting it out of my head. Um, it was 800 pages. <laughs> so I had to go back and cut quite a bit. Um, I was very hesitant to cut much of what my mom had written because this was her book and I wanted to stay true to that legacy. I never intended to publish this when I sat down to write it. It was, I just did it more for therapy after losing her. So I wasn't really thinking about the length so much. Um, and then when a publisher wanted to pick it up and, and she said, you know, would you think about cutting this into two different books? Um, I considered it briefly, <laughs> um, but I just couldn't find a natural place to end the story because it really, it goes along almost like poetry. Um, one thing flows into the next and, and it just didn't make sense to, to break it. So um, against probably the better judgment of my um, publisher, I said, let's go for it. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> But I have had a lot of a lot of reviews that people said they couldn't put it down and they finished it quickly. So absolutely I'm encouraged by that. Right. True. Mm -hmm. uh, because because it is poetic prose and because it is so very descriptive, it, it it's harder, as you said, it's harder to put it put the book down and uh, you know stop at a particular point. You 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 tend to read further. Okay, let let me get through this part. <laughs> that kind of was my intention. <laughs> Right. Now, may I request you to please read from your favorite section of the novel? Oh, good Lord. Okay. Um, sure. My favorite section. You know what? I'm going to have to go with the prologue. Um, and I know professional writers are probably gasping right now because prologues, you either love them or you hate them. Um, but this <laughs> one kind of made uh, sense to do it. Um, in, I'll read a, you'll just have to tell me when to stop reading because the prologue's a little sure, long. Sure, sure. <laughs> All right. Um, she sat on... All right. She sat on the sunset bench as she had so many times before, looking down past the craggy cliffs, grain in the twilight, past coconut palms and wild impatience, past Berinian ferns that nestled in the shadows and viny bougainvillea that danced on the winds and crystalline waters that plunged and splashed and cascaded their way back home to the sea. There, as always, she paused to gaze at the tranquil lagoon that so long ago had taught her to swim and to listen to the laughter of the new water babies that floated up from the beach on the warm, sweet air. It was not the carefully conceived laughter of adults. It was the full-bellied laughter of the very young, 
who knew nothing of social graces or care. Innocent, she whispered, and wished she could remember what that felt like. From the western edge of the lagoon, she heard the faint murmurings of friends and family coming together again at the end of another day. The voices emanated from the old wooden dock where islanders gathered to await the return of the evening launch from the mainland. She watched as the last of them trickled out of the palm grove in twos and threes, strolled down the beach past neat rows of dugout canoes, and headed out over the water between the brightly painted little fishing boats that bobbed up and down in perfect four, four time. The islanders looked almost indistinguishable from their ancestors as they milled about in their bare feet in richly patterned sarongs, but the illusion would end with the arrival of the launch and the impeccably tailored suits that nightly filled down her gangplank. She had been coming to the bench for many years now, climbing the steep cliff side path with flashlight in hand for the safe return home after sunset. Tonight, though, she carried a bottle of grandfather's wine and mama's favorite goblet, the cobalt blue one. She took its color from the night sky over the island. She held the goblet at arm's length and spun in gently by the stem until she was mesmerized by the kaleidoscope patterns of light and shadows that danced on her arm. This goblet should have been mama's. She put the goblet to her lips and sipped long and slow, letting the wine wash over her tongue before swallowing. By the time it had cooled her throat all the way down, she had turned her thoughts to a happier time. The day she first came to the bench on that glorious spring when the family returned to the island from Papa's posting in San Francisco. She remembered that, that day clearly, how she left the cool jade blue waters of looking behind and followed after Grandfather and Mem and Mama and Papa as they snaked in and out of view on their daily ascent to the beach. She remembered the arduous climb and how hot and breathless she felt and how, when she finally reached the shade of the plateau, the cool damp of the jungle floor and her bare feet renewed her. She could almost hear the bits of laughter and easy conversation that had reached her ears long before the, she was in sight of the bench and how, when she arrived there, she found the couples already lounging comfortably, sharing a bottle of grandfather's chilled island wine, red-cheeked and smiling and as always demonstrably affectionate. She could hear them speaking even now about that day and many before it in no particular order, just a random collection of remembrances which together fashioned a collage of their family history, or at least a small part of one. They were recalling some of the special places to which Papa's work had taken the family, the funny little attic bedroom in London, the marble floors in the Paris apartment where she and Emma played ice capades in their stocking feet, and the big house that perched on the peak over Hong Kong where she held little James up to the scales hope on the veranda so he could watch the ships come into port. When Mama looked up and saw her approaching, she didn't seem surprised. She just smiled and said, I've been waiting for you, and without further comment, handed her a half-filled goblet of wine, her first, which had been well diluted to a pale pink color by the numerous ice cubes that clinked against the glass. She remembered exactly that's, how uh, everyone looked that day. Lovely. Yeah. That's... that's <laughs> So, so, uh, such, such fine descriptions. And at the same time, uh, I, I think it's so sensory. That's, that's what makes it so very riveting. I think my mom really intended to have it written that way, where she, um, she wanted it to be a movie in, in the reader's mind. Um, I think she always intended to publish it. She, she just never got there until I picked it up. Um, but the prologue sets up the entire rest of the story um, and gives hint at what's going to happen down the road. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, how long did it take for you to write this and um, what has been a revolution in this journey of writing your novel? Um, it took me eight years um, on and off. Um, I, in the time that, that I sat down to start writing this, I was working full time in marketing and advertising and I also had a baby. Um, which really kind of took up a good majority of my time, as most mothers would probably know. So I, I picked it up and set it back down. And then when I finally finished writing it as a first draft, I kept going over and over and over it and could not put it down um, until I finally just had to stop myself. Um, and that's probably, for me, it, it, the greatest, um, you know, when, you, when you're in marketing and advertising, you kind of write it one or two times and you're done. Um, for me, the greatest thing was that I could I could still be writing this, um, you know, and it's been published for six months. So it's really, you know, being able to put it down, um, but also knowing that all of a sudden I was able to write creative writing and not just marketing and advertising copy. Um, and to me, I was really proud of that because it's very different from what I'm used to. 
absolutely and and um, it, it, not only is it a fulfilling experience but but there is uh, some kind of a catharsis isn't it uh, particularly in writing a novel and a novel that stems from s- such a wonderful back story it really is i mean it gives you the chance to escape um into a different world um where any of the stresses around you or anything that's going on good or bad just kind of falls off to the side it's um it's the same with reading a book i mean reading a book for me is escapism um and and that's i think important for people um we all need a break absolutely absolutely now i noticed a very uh, evocative cover is so soothing and uh, how how all how involved were you in uh, designing this cover um you know what it was amazing i <laughs> the artist captured exactly what i wanted um from it i gave him the epilogue or the uh, prologue and just said you know the only thing that the only thing i have is that this has to be at sunset um uh, apart from su- a sunset being very important almost like a character in this book throughout my mother also loved sunsets um and so i just gave him the prologue and this is what he came up with and i i I couldn't be happier. I can I can imagine that. It's it's a beautifully done uh, with the flowers and the sunset and 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 a hint of the island uh, that you're talking yes. about <laughs> in in the novel. Who is your favorite character in this novel and um, what is the one unique thing you learned about the 1960s and 70s during the course of writing? Oh gosh. Well, you know, I I have two favorite characters and they're so intertwined. Um Ari and her mother. Um part of it's the relationship they had mirrors the relationship I had with my mom. Um and my mom I think the two of them together is a combination of who my mother was. Um my mother was 17 in 1967 in San Francisco. So a lot of this to people that knew her is actually kind of an autobiography. Um with a lot of of fiction in there. Um and, and so I think I think learning about my mother and what she experienced um hidden within these characters um and in her life as she came of age um was probably the thing I learned most about the 60s and 70s. Um you know apart from I, I don't want to give any of the details away because some of the places that the book takes place in later on I had to study and I learned a lot from what those places were like in the 60s and 70s but um I'd give away too much if I talk specifically about that <laughs> right yeah obviously I wouldn't want you to do that <laughs> <laughs> now now as a writer do you feel that uh, it is important to experience um, or to have experience very mental pain of some sort in order to write with profundity Um I don't think it it's a requirement by any means um for me it helped because I'm not a creative writer by nature um and so being able to pull out that pain and that emotion um you know much like probably maybe a method actor would um uh, drawing upon real life experiences um you know and that's that's kind of the nature of this book i think a lot of people will be able to connect with these characters because we've all been there um in in certain aspects of it um so for me it was really important to be able to draw on that emotion i don't i don't know about other writers i think there's certainly writers out there that that just have that ability to come up with a whole world that they don't necessarily have to have lived in at some point. Yeah, I I think it's a it's a blend of both types while while some would say that it's important to have those kind of uh, life altering experiences some others can actually mm-hmm. imagine those. Yes. Right. Now, so when and how it, it depends on the writer. True, absolutely. It it, it is subjective and there there is no yeah, there's no hard and fast rule to that. <laughs> Now when and how do you write and um, who are the writers that have inspired you Um well I mean I when and how is whenever I can um I haven't um I've been so busy with grants and marketing and um I have not had a chance to write I have an idea for a second book um whether it ever gets from here into a, an actual book is is anyone's guess at this point Um but I you know I I have to write where it's quiet. Um I need peace around me. I 
music to really delve into the emotional aspect of whatever I'm writing. Um, it, it, I even do it for grants because I grants you need to write from a point of being passionate about whatever your you know your your foundation does. Um, and and I, so I have to have that um, that that place where I can not be distracted. I'm easily distracted. Um, but I'm a mom, so that's probably normal for everybody. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of Sidney Bechet and Josh Groban and Vivaldi involved in writing this book. Um, you know, and, and how it's just when it speaks to you. There was times where I said, oh, I should probably go try and write. I haven't written for a while. And then I sit down and there's nothing. <laughs> it's just and you get frustrated. It's writer's block. Everybody gets it. Um, but I found, at least personally, if I got to that point where I did have writer's block, I needed to get up and walk away um, just right. so that I didn't become frustrated with it. And then other times, I, in the middle of the night, I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, I finally figured out how to write that. And I'd have to get up and go do it because I'd be guaranteed to forget by the next, you know, the next morning. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I, I must tell you, I've had similar moments and quite, quite often, actually. <laughs> right. Now, what has been the best compliment so far? Um, oh, gosh. You know, I, it's really been a combination of things. Um, one of the best compliments I got really on an emotional level was somebody picked this up right after losing their mother to cancer. And how it really kind of reminded them of the connection between them and their mother. And, and because this book kind of was my experience of going through the same thing, it creates a connection. It's, it's very hard to know what it's like until it happens. Um, and so that was really sweet. They said that it helped them get through a really difficult time in their life. Um, you know, but, and then I, I've also had, you know, other people that have said they just couldn't put it down. And they read it, you know, within 48 hours, which is amazing to me. Um, and they just wanted to know what happened and that it was a movie in their mind. And, and they've compared me to, you know, some other authors um, that have just, you know, that are very well known. <laughs> I just, I just um, you know, that's pretty incredible yeah. to me. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Now, how did you transition from um, content and commercial writing to penning a novel? How, how easy or difficult was this transition? Um, you know, I mean, this was such a unique situation on how this came about. Um, it really, I think a lot of it was because I was so emotional at the time of, of writing this um, that it just naturally happened because I needed to get those emotions out and those emotions you don't do in marketing. It's just, you know, just try and keep that all separate. Um, so it really wasn't hard for me. Um, but, you know, being a journalism major, I had a foundation for writing. I love to read, um, you know, thank goodness for Kindle Unlimited. Otherwise, I would be completely broke. Um, and so I think I drew on that experience, the foundation of writing and journalism and then reading and reading and reading. It, it just was an easy, natural flow for me. Um, but my mom made it very easy, too. I mean, she didn't. It, there wasn't a lot that I had to do to come up with the base that was there. She described the characters so well I felt like I knew them before I even started writing the end of their story um, right. so that helped out a lot right fair enough now since you mentioned you're an avid reader what are you reading currently <laughs> I am currently reading um, oh gosh of all the times for you to ask me that I am reading a um, historical novel about Chateau Marmont and um, Los Angeles and all of the you know golden age of Hollywood gossip going on that happened there on the Sunset Strip. So um, you know that's very not usual for the type of books I read. I love reading romance novels. I admit to it freely. Um, it's my escape uh, into the world. But yeah, right now I'm I'm going toward the biography aspect of things. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Now, uh, what are you working on next? Um, you said that it's there in your mind and then it just has to get get down onto paper or more onto your laptop to be precise. No promises that it will actually happen. But there is a story um, that I instantly kind of connected with, the backstory of the parents in Bird of Paradise. 
um, because their relationship is so central in this book um, that I, I just know that there is a way of writing their story and how they met and how they came together and how they got to the beginning of this book. Um, and so right. that's kind of where I'm going. So we'll see if that happens. But to do that, I need to go all the way back to the 1940s, which is going to be very interesting. Um, that would be but, interesting yeah, we'll indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And tell us a little bit about volcanology and um, what got you hooked onto it. Um, you know, when I was a little kid, Mount St. Helens and Vesuvius fascinated me. There was a National Geographic magazine that came out on both of them. And I used to, you know, well, when I say read, because I was probably about six or seven, I looked at the pictures um, and then, you know, started reading it. And it just was something odd that fascinated me about the power that you know volcanoes have and and how they've transformed you know entire civilizations like Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii so that kind of set it off um and then I got into college and I had to get a science credit and I am not a chemistry or physics kind of person I mean there's a reason why I went into journalism um, so I there was a volcanology course that would satisfy my science credit so I took it um, and loved it and loved the professor. And I ended up at that point with the elective options that I had, just keep taking his classes all the way up into where I was um, pretty much the only one there that wasn't a grad student, but I got permission to take the class. That's kind of where that all went, oddly enough. <laughs> Very interesting. I, I've, I've hardly come across anybody who says that uh, volcanology is their passion. And it, it was intriguing uh, for me to uh, <laughs> say that you, you well, do. My, my honeymoon was to Costa Rica to Arenal Volcano, and we stayed at the National Geographic Observatory Lodge. Um, so rather than you know the resort or the cruise, we went hiking up a volcano. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's novel again. <laughs> All right. Now, um, what is that one marketing strategy that you have used to promote your book that has worked? You know that is so hard. Um, because I have, you know, I have done promotion and marketing and advertising for years now. And it's, you know, as you get into it, it's very easy to do for somebody else. It is incredibly difficult to do it for yourself. Even though I know all of the strategies and everything, um, it, it, it's just been, it's been so hard because I don't know if it's because I'm afraid to talk about myself or, or what it is. Um, I think social media has probably been one of the biggest okay. things. Uh, you know, obviously word of mouth. I mean, the first people that are going to buy your book are going to be people, you know, and then they're going to start telling people who tell people. Um, so it's really important to utilize the network you've already got in place um, and not be afraid to tell everybody that you know that you have written and published a book. I mean, I even told my dentist. Um, <laughs> social, media, social media is such a great way to get out there and meet people. Um, that you'd never have the ability to to get together with, um, and and other writers, um, you know, Instagram and Twitter for all the bad that you know people have it for. It's also a way to meet other people that are just like you and share ideas. Um, and I think that's kind of been the best outlet and the best marketing strategy for someone that's completely unknown, um, you know, outside of what she does for a living. <laughs> I, I can imagine that and I, I think uh, uh, I can relate to what you said that you, you were talking about your novel even with your dentist uh, practically everybody from my household to everybody knows that now I have got a book out there <laughs> well I mean when I went into this I told my husband I said if I can sell one book to somebody that is not a relative I've succeeded in my goal and um, and I did so you know it worked <laughs> but yeah you got to get Everybody, don't be afraid to sell yourself. Um, it, publishing a book is an amazing feat for anybody, and it should be celebrated and bragged about. Absolutely, and and it's uh, so much of hard work goes into it, and it's 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 only fair that you talk about it. And it, it gets the due that it deserves. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is this book is like my second child, um, you know, and it, it's you want to talk about it. <laughs> Fair enough. Any special message for viewers of the Writer Talks? I, 
I think really, you know, from my experience, um, you know, any, any message that I would give an aspiring writer, it, it just write what you love and what comes to you. Um, it, so many people, well, not so many people, but I, you can really tell when a writer does not believe in what they're writing, they're writing to an audience. And that is something, you know, it may help sell books, but at least for me, it wouldn't have been as satisfying. I wrote this for me, um, and whatever came of it for somebody else was just gravy on it. Um, and so just staying true to yourself is, I think, in any place in life, um, you know, and that's really kind of a big theme in this book is finding your place in life and liking who you are and knowing who you are. Because once you get to that place, which my mom called sanctuary, the world is your oyster, but you've got to find you first. Um, and I, so, I think that's really important. That's that's really vital, love, being true to oneself and uh, true to your own style of writing. And I totally agree with you with that. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for being on the Writer Talks and would surely recommend Bird of Paradise for its, uh, as I keep uh, repeating, poetic prose, absolutely poetic prose, rich descriptions and imagery. It has been a pleasure talking to you, Emily. I will. Yes, for me too. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Ahoy. <laughs> Bye.